the kids' corner. That was, uh, that special was beautiful. Just going forward, I just want everybody to know, I refuse to work after people of such talent. <laughs> but thank you, that was absolutely beautiful. I think I felt like I've already been to church. Just, just with that, that is so, so good. You know, we're at the point now, I think, I, I'm sensing a turn. The turn is, I see culturally, we've all seen everything in culture kind of collapse around us. <laughs> we've been... The people we thought we should trust, we're no longer trusting. And I think we're finding a lot of things wanting. And I hope we all are starting to feel this great privilege of being able to say, I am among those who count themselves as belonging to Jesus Christ. As uh, our primary uh, identity. You know, there's a battle we have. We, we just get done with Easter just a couple weeks ago, and Easter is such a high point, and then get, you know what we got to do? we got to go back out in our normal lives. And this is not new. I know celebrating the resurrection is easy on a Sunday. It's easy at church with other believers, yet there are times when we just don't feel like it. And that's probably a lot of the time. How do we practice the resurrection? How do we live out the resurrection at work and in our daily lives? How do we do it with a boss or a system that feels unfair and uncaring? Your problem's not new. The early believers lived in the Roman Empire. They believed in the resurrection, and then they had to go believe in the resurrection as Nero. You've heard about him? Nero is now taking charge. About the time Paul's writing this, our passage today. And we don't have it near that bad. In fact, Paul wrote this somewhere right around the beginning of Nero's reign. A, ne- a reign that at the end of Nero's reign will result in Paul's death. Um, so how we live the resurrection is vital to the faith. I love proper belief. I love proper doctrine and all that kind of stuff. But none of that I think is important. Is just how we live our lives in the week. I hope you've had a good week. I've had one thing. I had a a little project I'd been working on. I had to present it on Wednesday. And uh, um, you will hear it too on Pentecost Sunday, a few weeks from now. Or at least a version of it, not exactly the same thing. I'm going to read out of Romans chapter 13. Practicing the resurrection or living out the resurrection at the workplace, which is what we all do. Paul writing, he says, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. I hate that verse. This is one of the verses I don't like. Because sometimes I don't like the authorities that much. Most of the time, I don't like the authorities that much. Virtually all the time, I don't like the authorities that much. Not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. Can I tell you how I don't like paying taxes either? (laughs) By the way, this is the week for this verse anyway, after just getting done on Tuesday. Um, For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. So give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except a continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber... Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night's nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness or in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. All right. That's a fairly well-known passage. I think... 
how do we practice the resurrection at work? Or how do we practice the resurrection in our daily lives? Our daily mundane lives, which is where most of life is led. I know a lot of times we want to pursue high point to high point, mountaintop to mountaintop, but most of life is lived on the plains. If we decided we're going to have a wonderful week of vacation in Colorado, that's fine. But can I tell you, everywhere from here to west of Denver, the scenery doesn't change that much. So I think the first thing, I think, in practice the resurrection, I think we all need to get used to just doing what we should. But what if I don't feel like it? One of the things is I think God's people, we should be examples of responsibility and integrity. You've probably heard this, half of life is just showing up. I think there's part of that that's true. Um, And we live in a world that has forgotten how to show up. You've seen the stats, you've watched the news the last two years. We've lived in a, we've li- we're living in a culture that has forgotten how to go to work. There are businesses that aren't open because they can't find anybody to work. And there are people that have employees that still can't find anybody to work. You've heard it said, 20% of the people do 80% of the stuff. I think that's ridiculous. 10% of the people do 90% of the stuff. We don't want to teach anymore, lest someone might get offended. So we don't say much. We do not want to parent anymore. We don't want to sometimes hold people accountable anymore, lest we demonize them. Sorry, fresh from the news this week. The collective wisdom of the community is still vital. What does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a parent? What does it mean to be a young lady? What does it mean to be a young man? We've abandoned all of this. Now we seem to just have, just kind of drop people on the ground and let them figure it out. I grew up largely most of my life without a father in the home, and I am thankful for a host of people, I can can name off names, who, uh, um, who did not leave things up to me. I hear myself giving some of their lessons that I didn't get at home. Hey, Doug, how you doing? I'm doing great, Doug. Stand up when you shake my hand. Doug, grip firm when you shake my hand. Look me in the eye when you shake my hand. Show up on time all the time. All the stuff, these were lessons that I did not hear from someone in my house. It's from other people. I'd hate to live in a culture where we don't say those things anymore. And that's what we're getting. How about integrity, doing what you should? Integrity means doing what you should. All the time. So if you are paid for a job, do the job. If you're in school and they ask you to do an assignment, do the assignment. And I'm really grouchy about this right now. If the professor asks for at least a five-page paper, turn in at least a five-page paper. (sighs) Sorry, my blood pressure is going back down. And try to do good work while you're at it. A couple years ago, I was in suburban Detroit. Occasionally, some of you know, I get asked to go show up at another part of the country. We do these like where we're actually the people who are just starting the path to ordination as a pastor. And I get asked to go and participate in their you know, week where we're doing some assessments and all that stuff. I was in suburban Detroit, and this fairly large gentleman with a beard, I was sitting in a chair, came up behind me, and he grabbed me in the shoulders, and he said, 
Prof Ward, it's so good to see you. And I turned around and I said, good to see you too if I knew who you were. <laughs> and it was, it was someone who I'd had 20 years ago in a class and he said some things about some things that I had said in that class. And it was so, it was so nice that he had took a lesson to heart. And he said, I never forgot it. Whatever you're asked to do, finish it. Do good work. Even if the boss is gone. Even when no one is looking. Be an example. We do this not because we want to, though sometimes we might want to, but we do this because we're representing Christ in everything that we do. And I want to leave a pleasant aroma behind what we do and what we say and what we're asked to accomplish. So be a person of integrity all the time. We can work with people we may not like. I know it's better to work with everybody that we like, but sometimes you're going to have to work with someone you don't like. It's just the way it is. So... Give the boss respect, even if he doesn't deserve it. Give the policeman respect, even if he wrote you a ticket in Wisconsin for driving with Illinois plates. Give, it happens. It happens. It happens in Michigan, too, but I'll, I'm going to jump off that. Again, my blood pressure is going up, so I'll just, I'll just back that off here a second. Give your parents respect, even if at times they might not, you feel, deserve it. Because how we live is important. It's vital. Paul says some interesting words in, in, in uh, Romans 13. He says, your salvation is nearer now than ever before. Now, we think, what does that mean? Remember, Nero is ascending the throne. When Paul says this a little bit, he's talking about a lot of things. When he says your salvation is near, he might, at least to some of the people, saying, your death is nearer than ever before. That's a reality. Undergoing trial, it won't last forever. Things are bad right now, they won't always be bad. I wish that's a lesson that everybody would take to heart. There are people that feel like this, the bad week they're having now is just always going to be here. This will never end. It will end. It will end. No pain will last. There will be a time it stops. The good news is, the good news of the resurrection that we're practicing is, death will never have the last word ever again. Because so we don't need to fear it. So when they say salvation is near, they have deliverance from now in mind. Why? Because Nero is in charge. And I'm not picking on anybody, picking on anybody so I'm going to do the wide sweep. Nero in charge is bad. That's even worse than Biden being in charge. That's even worse than Pritzker being in charge. Though that's pretty close. That would be worse than Trump being in charge. I'm being equal opportunity. Not picking on anybody. It's a reminder that the clock ticks for all of us. I was just thinking, if the actuarial tables are right, I'm at the end of the third quarter. Wow, isn't that awe-inspiring? No, not really. However, in Canton, Ohio, there's a Hall of Fame, a football Hall of Fame, and it's filled with people who are there because they were famous for how they performed in the fourth quarter. And so regardless of where the actuarial tables say, where the clock that's ticking say you are, finish well. Because it doesn't matter what's happened before, from this point on with Christ, finish well. He says night is ongoing. Um, 
says, the hour has come. Your salvation is near now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The night, for most of us, is now. With a lot of different things. Even if life is going great. Look, I, I, I am so thankful with a, a lot of things. I have, my life has been wonderfully blessed. I don't have a lot of heartache. Um, I don't have really ex-friends. I don't know that I've been betrayed by anybody. Um, I know some people have. That's all good things. But even compared to what's coming, this is still night. This life is unfair. This life is hard. This life, while beautiful, is filled with trials and hardships. And even when blessed, we can say these things. Oh, there's come a time, you know, when that, that thing is going to ache. You'll get the bad news from the doctor. I mean, we all have challenges in this life, all of us. And that's just part of it. And so life, in some ways, does equal night. I was about, I was in sixth grade, and I, and, and I don't know exactly why, but when I was in sixth grade, when I was a kid, I was half nuts. Some people say, what's changed? Um, and I went through this period of time in sixth grade where I just did decide, I just wasn't sleeping. I had really bad insomnia. I didn't sleep. I'd get up in the morning. I'd go to school. I'd look at the clock. It'd be nine o'clock. And I would look at the clock going, oh man, only 13 more hours and I got to go to bed again. And I dreaded it because I know I just lay there all night and I wouldn't sleep and I wouldn't sleep. And it was awful. I dreaded the evening coming. And at some point, I can't remember what it was, I just got to a point I was tired of it. And I said, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. If I sleep, I don't sleep. Ah, I don't care. If I don't sleep, I'll get up, I'll read a book, I'll do something. And there was something about not that switched that, and all of a sudden, that kind of just went away. We often we live with night around us and we dread it and i'd like to oh, and we sometimes we worry so much i want to avoid every shred of trial and every shred of hardship and i don't know that that's going to be possible but there's a point whatever i'm going through i've got christ that's standing right beside me i know that's not going to have the last word and i know there's going to be an end and this night will not be the thing that gets me because of the resurrection They go through a list of things. I tend to not like lists, but here is what he said. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light, let us behave decently as in the daytime. Live your life like people can see. Because people can see. And again, I'm sorry, I know if you go to the airport, people are dressed like they're invisible, that no one can see them. Live like people can see you. There is no private life. We think there's, there's public morality and private morality. The only difference between the two is one set of eyes that you didn't account for seeing you. And you don't get to control that. Someone can always see, at least, especially when we least expect it. Romans has a list. Let me go through the list real quick and then I'm Here's what Paul says. He says, um, Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness or sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension or jealousy. I'm not worried about the first four. No, I'm not looking out here. I know that's not the crowd this is. Um, but remember the last two. Don't participate in dissensions or jealousy. You could almost convince me that Paul saw social media coming down the pike. Tim, I'm going to give it credit to Tim. I think he might have coined this phrase. Um, he called it years ago, about 10 years ago. Social media gives us a chance for recreational anger. And I like that. It's one of those ones that has always stuck with me because I think that's what we do. How about one other thing? Perhaps it's a good idea for us to live like Jesus is seen. 
I think our culture has forgotten this on a lot of different levels. Now, this makes me laugh a little bit. Remember some of the songs? We Remember VBS when you were a kid? If you're under the age of 30, you can forget about this. But those that's been around for a while, we used to sing a song. And when you think about the song, it's, it, there's, it, it does induce a chuckle. But it says, oh, be careful, little children, what you do. There's a father up above looking down on us with love. So be careful, little children, what you do. It's a little bit of mixed messaging in there. <laughs> but there is a little bit of truth in there to live in a way that would bring honor and respect. But the last thing that Paul says, and I know I took the verse lot out of order, he says it in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these is love. In 13, chapter, in verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except a continuing debt to love one another. There is one other standard that should set us apart all the time, and that's love. Wait a minute, you mean love the boss? Yes. You mean love the guy I don't like? Yes. Well, what is love then? Well, love's that thing that seeks the best for other people, even if that love is never returned. Even if that love is greeted with indifference. Even if that love is greeted with hate. I know we are talking about the workplace, but this is a great standard for all of life. Love always seeks the best. We know some of this. Love seeks the best for our children, even when it is not returned. You know how many times in the last 20 years, Sunday morning, someone's come in and I've said, great to see you, how are you this week? And the first response I get is, you know any place that'll take two children? I mean, I've heard stuff like that. And I know what you mean. I was a young parent. Adam was about a year old. He had this like thing he did where sometimes he would just, I was holding him on, on my lap, you know, sitting on my lap. He was looking out. And for some reason, he would just like dig his feet in and shoot up, you know, like, like just jump and stiffen. And he caught me right here once, where immediately everything swells up. And M Michelle was in the kitchen. And I yelled, ow, or something. And she goes, what's going on in there? And I said, take your son before I throw him through a wall, or something like that. And there's times like that, that we always feel that way, but we don't. It works in marriage. Culturally, we think marriage, follow me here, we think marriage is the promise we receive to have our needs met by the other person. <laughs> How's that working for you? <laughs> and then when they're not, we go, oh, I made, I made the wrong choice. I'll wait for the next one. The next one down the line, they're going to meet all my needs. They're going to intuitively. I heard a comedy routine this week. It was a guy, I can't remember his name. He said, any, any young husbands out there, and a couple people raised their hand, he goes, all right, let me, let me, let me talk to you. Let me, I'm going to teach you the language of wife. And he said, have you ever, if, if your young wife comes in and says, are you thinking about going to the store today? That means... Buddy, you're going to the store today. <laughs> Actually, I think the marriage vows are, I promise to love. Well, or we think this. I promise to love, honor, and cherish until you have a bad month. No, we said something like, until death, us do part. I promise to love, but that love does not stop with our home. It does not stop with our kids. It does not stop with our spouse. It's what we offer other people. And remember, and I can't say this enough, Nero is lurking in the background here. These are not just empty platitudes. These are written at a time when this literally meant life and death. 
literally meant life and death. There's a great scene in a relatively new movie, and I called it, it escaped my attention. Um, came out like right as COVID was starting or something like that, and I ordered it two weeks ago. I saw it. It's called Paul, the Apostle of Christ. Jim Caviezel, who some of you know, plays Luke, and the movie is all about literally the last days of Paul, and, and he's, Paul is telling Luke the stories, and Luke is writing the book of Acts. And at the end of the movie, there's a wonderful scene. Um, Paul is in prison. Um, well, he's under house arrest in Rome. And he, he had a guard that was um, assigned to Paul just to watch him. Paul could receive guests. He just couldn't leave. And Paul had, was trying to befriend this uh, Roman guard. And uh, this guard had a daughter who was sick. And this is a guard who was there as Paul had been scourged. And at the beginning had been very rough on Paul. Paul's an old man at this time. And as his daughter lay close to death, there's a scene that goes back and forth between this daughter laying on the bed and the tears of her parents and Paul praying for her in prison. The guard is there as Paul is mistreated, and Paul still reaches out to him. It is so easy to sideline the people that we meet for a variety of reasons. We relegate them to our shadows. This should not be us. Our challenge at work is to love all the people, even the difficult people. That's our challenge at school. That's our challenge in our neighborhood. That's a challenge as we navigate life. That's our challenge on the tri-state. That's our challenge everywhere. That Paul's, as he writes this, and he said, look, as you practice the resurrection, remember, live as if you're being seen, and remember... The greatest thing you can do, the greatest of these, is always love. 